you, Pastor. We'll certainly be praying for you tomorrow and that procedure. We've been praying for you through all of this. And, you know, God's ways are not our ways, but God's always right. Amen. Amen. And the Lord teaches us things through the schools of adversities that we don't learn any other way. I wish there were other ways to learn it, but God's had to take me through the ringer to teach me many things. And His people, uh, as one old writer said, God has no dry dock ships. He always sets them out in the stormy seas. Amen. And He proves the ships and our faith along the journey. But I appreciate Brother Charles Lawson. I thank God for his ministry and uh, the labors of this church and the outreach. Sometimes you... You know, you sit here and you may think, well, you know, where's our outreach at? But I had a fellow from Texas uh, that called me some time ago and said, I've been listening to you preach. I said, where? He said, uh, there's a, a, a broadcast that comes over the Internet, uh, Temple Baptist Church over in Knoxville. Uh, Brother Charles Lawson said, uh, they have some of your stuff on their, on their web there. And I've listened to that. And I said, well, how about that? Amen. And so uh, I praise the Lord for the outreach of this church and the ministry, not only the television and uh, uh, the World Wide Web and printed page and all the other things, but I appreciate the privilege to be here this morning, have my wife and my family. And uh, church, we need revival. Amen. And that's what I want to talk to you about. Turn to the book of Jude, if you will, please, this morning. And I want to preach on this subject, it's time for Jude. It's time for Jude. You can stand all over the house today as we reverence God's Word together. In verse number 17 of the book of Jude, it says, But beloved, remember the words which were spoken before of the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ, how that they told you there should be mockers in the last time who should walk after their own ungodly lusts. These be they who separate themselves sensual, having not the Spirit. But ye, beloved, building up yourselves on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Ghost. Lord, I pray you'll open our eyes to the truths of the Word of God this morning. And I ask you to speak to every heart that's assembled here. Those that may hear by other means, I ask you, God, to take this Word and put it down deep in souls. Father, we pray for Brother Lawson to Mars. He has this procedure that it might be successful, that you might strengthen him. Lord, touch him physically, and God, keep him encouraged spiritually. And Lord, thank you for this church, and I pray, God, that you'd help them to uh, continue to stand by the man of God as, as he goes through these things. And Lord, I thank you for what you're doing. We're glad that uh, you said that it's not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord of the host. And uh, you said, when I'm weak, I'm made strong. And Lord, we are seeing your strength in these days. And I pray you'd manifest your strong harm even in this service this morning. Glorify your name now. We plead the blood of the Lord Jesus. In his name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. The Mayan calendar ended and some had predicted that would be the end of the earth. Then once it did, they said, oh no, that's not what we meant at all. We meant that would be the end of an age and the beginning of another age. Well, regardless of what the mind calendar says or does not say, we are entering into another age. That is the age of the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. And I know there have always been many antichrists, but there's a wind of change that's blowing around this globe. And I believe that as God's children, we need to be more prepared now than we've ever been for the coming of our Savior. Now, Brother Jude is that book that comes right before the Revelation. And as we enter into the vestibule of this church, before you enter into the Revelation, you enter into the vestibule of the book of Jude. The book of Acts describes for us the Acts of the Apostles. Shows us the early part of the church, but the book of Jude describes for us the acts of the apostates and the condition of the last time and what you and I would have to face. And I'm preaching this morning on it's time for Jude. And what I mean by that, it's time for this message of Jude to be preached to our generation and to help us as God's people to have our eyes open to the things that are upon us. Now, Brother Jude does what a lot of preachers do. He, he had it in his heart to preach one thing, but God 
redirected him to preach something else. Now notice verse 1, 2, and 3. There is a call to arms. Brother Jude writes to the sanctified and the preserved in Christ Jesus and the called. He says, mercy unto you and peace and love be multiplied. And then he said, beloved, I gave all diligence to write unto you the common salvation. That was what was in his heart. That was his desire to speak of the common salvation. That it's not just for the Jew, but it's for the Gentile. It's not just for the bond, but it's for the free. It's not just for the wise, but for the unwise. Not just for the uh, learned, but for the barbarian as well. And Brother Jude has this stirring up in his soul that it is a whosoever will gospel to go into all the world, to every kindred, every tribe, every tongue, every nation of people. And uh, he wants to present to us how we drink of a common cup. When I preach in Russia, sometimes they'll have the Lord's table and they don't have little individual serving cups there. They'll have one large cup. And they'll start at the beginning and go all the way through the congregation. And everybody takes of the same cup graciously. They normally start with a visiting preacher. And I, I'm glad for that. Amen. Uh, but they don't have the, the pre-made little package of, of bread that's already broken up. They have one loaf. And when it comes by, you get a little pinch of that bread. And really that's representative of how we all drink of the same cup. You may be older, younger, smarter, or you may be richer, whatever, but it really doesn't matter. If you're saved by the grace of God, you partake of the cup of the blood of Jesus and the bread of His broken body and His salvation. And there are not two Jesuses or ten Gospels. There's one message, one Gospel, one Lord, but He is sufficient for all that partake of Him. Boy, this thing welled up in Jude's heart, and he said, that's what I wanted to write about, but he said, now I found it more needful for me to write unto you and exhort you that ye should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. He said, I want to give a call to arms. I want to call God's people to uh, be ready to diligently contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. Now, that knocks Mormonism in the head because they'll do their advertisement of Send in, we'll send you a King James Bible and another testament of Jesus Christ, another revelation. Well, the Bible said he once delivered it, not once and then again to Joseph Smith or anybody else. But uh, when the Lord said amen in Revelation, he put the seal on it. I was witnessing to a Mormon man coming out of Salt Lake City and I just asked him, I said, what do the Mormons believe? I've heard, but I want to hear it from your mouth. And he told me, and it's basically what I'd read and what I knew. And uh, I said, well, uh, I'll tell you, you can add to it if you want to, but I'm afraid of the last chapter of Revelation where God set a seal on this book and said, if you add to it, I'll add to you the plagues. And said, I'll take away your part out of the book of life. And I said, I, I'm not going to tamper with that. You can tamper with it if you want to, but I, I respect the word of God. But God said, I once delivered this faith unto the saints. And the same that the apostle Paul preached and the same that the Lord Jesus delivered. And the church has believed down through the ages is the same message that we have. I'm not looking for something new. I'm not looking to run after a new fad or uh, some new doctrine or some undiscovered truth. The church has missed all these ages. No, God delivered in plainness and in power the truths of the message of the gospel of the Son of God. And it's not ours to uh, add to that, but it's ours to preach that, practice that, and believe that. Now, these truths are under attack from every side. And as God's children, we need to realize that we are in a warfare. Physical attacks, spiritual attacks. There are financial attacks upon the church today. And we can't just take it sitting down, coming in and going through a few services, sitting on a pew and going to the house. We have to engage in this warfare and in this battle and know that our enemy wants to destroy this church and every other church, your pastor, and every other pastor across this country. And it's time for God's children to get real earnest about our faith and about the great commission that God has given us. Secondly, I see a confession or a characterization of the apostates of that which we're going to have to face. 
to know your enemy is to be able to better combat that enemy. Amen. If you just go into a dark place and you don't know the enemy or what he is or how he is, then you'll be blindsided many times. So God says, I'm writing to you about the last times, the times just prior to the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. And, and here's what will be present. Here's what you're going to face as a congregation, as an individual, as the people of God. Verse number four. For there are certain men crept in unawares. He said, first of all, you're going to deal with a lot of creeps. They're not going to come in blowing a trumpet and announcing, hey, I'm here to bring heresy. Hey, I'm here to change the charge. Here, I'm, I'm here to destroy the foundation of the Word of God. Dup, 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 dup. I want to take away the old hymns and put in all. They're not going to blow a trumpet and say, I'm a creep. No, they're like the fungus on the shower. It just shows up. Amen. Like that green stuff in the bathtub. It just, uh, you know, just it finds a way to get there. And our Bible colleges have been infiltrated. Our churches, our movements across the country have been infiltrated by these certain men, these creeps that came in unaware who were before of old ordained to this condemnation. God didn't just start condemning this yesterday. Uh, from old, from Cain, right on down. There have always been creeps that have come in to try to object to, destroy, fight, and change the truth of God. He said, ungodly men, turning the grace of our God into lasciviousness. So they'll have a message of grace, but it'll be a message of grace that come as you are, stay as you are, leave as you are. It's a message of, oh, you're saved, but now just do whatever you want to do. That's not the message of the Word of God. Titus said the grace of God teaches us. And what lesson does it teach us? To deny ungodliness and worldly lust that we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present evil world. And today our churches are filled with unconverted people that have made a profession, but their lives have never changed. And if your life has never changed, I'd say you've never been converted. For the scripture says, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. No, we're not perfect, but we do have a perfect Savior in us. And there is a presence of his divine holiness and power that presses the heart of a true genuine believer to do right and to want to do right. And their lives will change. Strange day we're living in. I was going to India and uh, a preacher and I were out walking one morning in Bombay getting ready to catch the airplane and uh, we were right there on the ocean. It's about 8 o'clock in the morning so we're trying to get rid of some jet lag, walk down the beach and back and as we were coming up this Indian fellow approached me and he said, uh, do you need a guide? I said, no, I don't need a guide. I'm going to that hotel. I'm going to get my bags. We're flying out of here headed to central India. He said, but I'll be your guide. And he hung out with me. And as we're walking along, he said, I know what you want. You want beer. I said, no, I don't drink beer. I despise the stuff. I had a friend of mine whose daddy was a drunk and saw how he suffered. And I don't care anything about beer. We walked on a little ways. He said, oh, I know what you want. You want cigarettes. I said, no. I don't want cigarettes. All I want is pure air in my lungs. I, I grew up around that as a kid, had my eyes burnt and throat burned by adults smoking around me. I can't stand the stuff. He went on a little ways further and said, oh, I know what you want. You want women. I'll get you women. I said, fella, I'm a happily married man. And on top of that, I'm a Christian and a Baptist preacher, and I sure don't want no Indian woman. He said, oh, I'm a Christian too. I take you to the Baptist church. <laughs> I said, well, how about that now? We, we, we got a Christian guy that's selling liquor and cigarettes and pimping on the side. But you know what? That's not just there. That turning the grace of God into lasciviousness is here. Chesapeake, Virginia, pastor said to me after service, I need to go make a house call. Families had a domestic dispute and would you go with me? I said, sure. We went there. Make a long story short, the daddy's 
son, 16 years old, had cussed his mom in the living room uh, in the kitchen in front of him, and he flew mad, gave him an uppercut, and knocked him across the floor, and they had a big knockdown drag out, come over there, and got to talking to him, and his mistake was this. He said, I never uh, laid a hand on that boy till just a while ago. I never spanked him, never disciplined him, and I thought, you don't start when they're 16 by cold cocking them across the kitchen floor. You start in pampers, amen? amen. That's how you train children from the time they're little children. But uh, at any rate, uh, he said, you know, I said, I was out in Las Vegas on a, a business trip, so I'll show you something. He went back in the back, got an hour daily bread, and in that Our Daily Bread was a business card. And he said, I want you to read that. And it looked, and he said, Madam so-and-so, house prostitution. I said, well, what's that? He said, well, this woman handed this to me on the street. And I said, no, I'm a Christian. I don't do that. She said, oh, I'm a Christian prostitute. And I give everybody an Our Daily Bread that's my customer. Now, that's where we're at in this country. It may not be as vocal as that, but there's a lot of folks sitting in our congregations today that have that very same mindset. I'll keep my sin and just add Jesus, sort of like a, a Hindu. You have to really watch them in India. They, oh yeah, I received Jesus, but I'll put him up here on the shelf along my other 942 idols. No, that's not the way it works. You rake all the idols off the shelf and it's Jesus and him alone. And the Lord said, except you repent, you shall all likewise perish. And so really, uh, the birthmark is, is there a change in your life? If Jesus comes in, you'll never be the same. I'm glad for repentance, praise God. Amen. Repentance means God take an old hippie and make him holy. It means God take a drunk and sober him up and let him drink of the fountains of God's amazing grace. It means God take an old heart and save her, wash her in the blood, change her life, put her up here in the choir, sing her with all her heart, the sweet holy songs of Zion. Glory to God for repentance. Amen. The Lord said in the last days there would be an attack on those that would turn, uh, by, by those that turn the grace of God into lasciviousness and Deny the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. He is the Lord Jesus Christ. Lord means master, overseer, ruler, and boss. And no man can serve two masters. We'll either serve him or we'll serve our flesh, but Jesus won't allow you to serve both. It's one or the other. Amen. And then he said, let me give you a history lesson. said, even... Uh, in Egypt, there were many that came out, but afterward, God destroyed them that believed not. In other words, there was a mixed multitude. There were a lot of them that partook of the physical ordinances and walked physically through the Red Sea, but when they got on the other side, it was evidence that they really weren't God's people in their murmuring. God opened up the heart of the earth and swallowed Korah and his crowd into hell with their clothes off. And there was always a mixed multitude among God's people. And Jesus warned us there would be wheat and tares. And it's not my place to figure out who's what. He said, there will come a day. And really, there was coming a day real soon when the harvest will come and the wheat will be taken into the barn and the tares will be cast into the fire. He speaks also, my friend, of the angels that kept not their first estate. And if God didn't let the angels buy, do you think he's going to let rebellious sinners buy? And then he spoke of Sodom and Gomorrah that gave themselves over to fornication and after strange flesh. And remember, this is prefaced in the last times, there shall come. We've seen legislation from our uh, Congress and Senate and President and executive orders and we've seen states and the perversion of same-sex marriage and all of these things, things you'd never dream when I was a boy, you'd have never dreamed would ever happen in this society and now it's just commonplace and it's not just in Hollywood, it's in Knoxville, Tennessee, it's all over our mountains, my friend, there's the perversion that has come and the Lord warned us you're going to face these things. He said, God in flaming vengeance of fire, made an example that others might fear. Somebody said, well, you know, that sin's no more than stealing a penny piece of candy. God didn't burn Sodom and Gomorrah to the ground because they slipped through the candy store and got a piece of candy. 
God burned them to the ground because of the perversion. And my friend, the changing of that which is against nature itself. Then he goes on to talk about how in the last days that there would be those in verse 11 that run after the way of Cain. The way of Cain is a bloodless religion. Abel said, what can wash away my sins? Nothing but the blood. Cain said, oh no, it's my potatoes and beans and corn and onions and watermelons and the best work of my head. That'll get the job done. And God would not honor Cain's offering, but he consumed Abel's offering. And Cain got angry. And the Bible said that Cain persecuted his brother Abel and he slew him. And that's the way of the bloodless religion. The Inquisition came through the hands of a bunch of murderers that didn't believe salvation was by the blood of Jesus alone. My friend, the persecutors that have always reached out against God's church have been those that believe in works religion. And he said that's going to be a prevailing thing, many following after the way of Cain. And you'd be surprised how many people you witness to that give that very answer I'm following after the way of Cain. They don't verbalize it like that. But, uh, for instance, David, my son, and his wife Lydia and I were up in uh, Canada. We went out on Prince Edward Islands to a Micmac Indian reservation to give everybody a gospel there and witness to them. And while we were there, we came around the corner and there was this... uh, a building, and, and my daughter-in-law Lydia said, oh, that's where uh, the lady that wrote Anna Green Gable stayed at while she was on the island and, and, and authored that book. And I said, okay. So we stopped in there, and there were three ladies standing in the yard. And uh, I spoke to them, and I said, is, is this a working church now, active church? She said, oh, yes, and I'm the pastor. I said, oh, okay. <laughs> I said, well, let me ask you a question. How does a man get to heaven? She said, well, basically by doing what I'm doing. I said, well, what are you doing? She said, I'm helping these two ladies plant flowers. I'm being a good neighbor. I said, so that's all I got to do, plant a few flowers and be a good neighbor. She said, yeah. I said, well, Jesus Christ must have been the biggest fool ever walked the face of the planet. She said, what? I said, if all I have to do is plant a few flowers and be a good neighbor to get to heaven... And Jesus didn't have to die on the cross. He proved that when they came after him. He said, I'm here, and they all fell backwards to the ground. They couldn't take him by force. And yet he died on the cross. I said, wouldn't he be very foolish if all I have to do is plant a few flowers and be a good neighbor? She said, well, no, no, he wasn't. I said, the reason he died is because planting flowers and being a good neighbor won't save you. It's the blood of Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God, the sacrificial Savior. That's the only way anybody can get saved. There's not enough good in you or me or anybody else to save ourselves. It's through His precious blood. I witnessed to somebody at the airport in Charlotte the other day. They gave me the same thing. I'm trying to be a good neighbor. You ask folk, what are you going to say when you stand before God? Well, uh, you know, I, I've done the best I could. That's works religion. That's the way of Cain. And it's going to be prevalent in these days. And then they ran greedily after the heir of Balaam. Balaam was for sale. He had a big for sale sign up. And Balak came by and said, I'll pay you. I'll grease your palm with gold and silver. Just curse the children of Israel for me. You know the story, he tried to curse them, but instead blessings came out of his mouth because you can't curse that which God is blessed. And that'll help you around Halloween time when these ghosts and goblins and witches brews get to stirring and all that. I'm glad, praise God, they can't curse what God is blessed. I'm saved by his grace, washed in his blood. They'll attack, there'll be war. But praise be unto God, I am protected by the power, the shield of the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. For hire. For hire. I wonder how much religious activity would go on if the money was taken out of it. They're coming after the tax-exempt status of the church. You can mark that down. Amen. And they're coming after God's men. You can mark that down. But I'm going to tell you, those that are God's men and God's church, they're going to go on. If they have to meet under a rock cliff or in an ivy thicket or in a basement somewhere, they're not in it for the money. Amen. Money's just a necessary evil we have to have to keep keep the doors open and the lights burning. 
God's children roll on in spite of it all. Amen. And then he said they perished in the gainsaying of Korah, rising up against the movings of God. And, you know, we want real revival. You let real revival happen and two things will happen. There will be a, a, a unity of God's people and there will be a division of those that, that don't want that work of God. We had a revival years ago in a church. And, I mean, God blessed, broke out and ran five weeks. And men saved and called to preach. And God just blessed. And sometime afterward, boy, the devil really attacked that church. And a preacher told me, he said, if that's revival, I don't know if I ever want another one or not. Because, I mean, they faced it. But then about a year later, he said, Brother Andy, i got to apologize to you for saying that. Because I, I didn't know what God was doing a real revival will bring a sword and it'll bring division. Yeah. And my friend, there is the gainsaying of Korah that will always rise up against Moses, a man of God, and the working of God. And he said, it'll be prevalent in the last days. Spots in your feast of charity. He talks about those that are twice dead, plucked up by the roots. Raging waves of the sea, foaming out their own shame. Wandering stars to whom is reserved the blackness of darkness. He says, you know, this message is not new. Just prior to the flood, just prior to when God judged the world with the great wrath of the flood, he had a man by the name of Enoch, the seventh from Adam, in verse number 14, prophesied. And here's the message he preached. And it's the same message that is relevant for today. The Lord cometh with ten thousands of his saints to execute judgment upon all, to convince all that are ungodly among them of all their ungodly deeds which they've ungodly committed and all their hard speeches which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. Murmurs, complainers walking after their own lust and their mouth speaking, speaking great swelling words, having men's persons in admiration because of advantage. Brother Enoch warned his day that if you continue following after ungodly ways, there will be the execution of judgment upon that. He goes on to say in verse number 18, in the last days there would be mockers. My, how the mockers have arisen. They've arisen in the political realm. When a president can stand on the national prayer day and say Jesus was a son of God, and he shrank back from uh, what he had to do and all that, and the many things that he said in blasphemy to the word of God. You can't govern a nation by the Bible, he says. What you gonna do, stone a rebellious son? The military can't stand up under the scrutiny of the Sermon on the Mount. And that's always the way the devil interprets the Bible by confusing the truths of the scripture. And when you take text out of context, you make pretext and then you have a, a, a sham and a mockery of the message that's presented. And if you want to go start raving crazy, you take a self-guided tour through this Bible. The Holy Ghost wrote this book and you'll never know it except the Spirit of God leads you to understand this blessed old book. Amen. And we've got mockers from the very top right on down. Television stations, comedians, newscasters, all the rest. And any way they can get a punch in toward the gospel and the people of God, uh, we're under attack on every side. Separate themselves. Essential, having not the spirit. And so it gives a characterization of the apostates. And I've just briefly ran over this, but... Lastly, I want to look at the Christian's alternative. The Christian's alternative. What do you mean, preacher? Well, look in verse number 20. He says, but, but, ye beloved. Now, there have been some very hard words that have been spoken in verse 1 through verse number 19. But when a father goes out in the yard and there are wolves growling and barking at his children, he doesn't step out in the yard and say, psst, psst, Go on, little wolfie. Go on, little wolfie. Right. No, he comes out the door with the shotgun a-blazing, a-screaming, and a-hollering to run those wolves off. He knows what they're going to do. He sees their bloodthirstiness. The little children might just see some new dogs coming up, but he knows they're wolves. And man, you can, you can hear the tone in verse 4 through verse number 19. There, there's a tone of, hey, children, wake up. These are wolves. They'll destroy you. But then after 
the action's over. Daddy gathers his children, sits down on the porch and hugs his children up and says, Now, now ye beloved, let me talk to you young'uns. I've got a little word to say to my children. And God doesn't talk to his children the way he talks to the apostate rebellious uh, devil's crowd that wants nothing to do with God and wars and fights against the things of God. He has another tone and another message for his beloved. And how are we going to stand? What's the alternative in these last days? Well, number one, there must be a belonging. But ye beloved, make sure which side you're on. Make sure you're in. Make sure you're one of those children and not one that's on the, on the other side of the fence in rebellion against God, but ye beloved. I'm glad, thank God, one day I got saved. I was on the other side of the fence. I'd blasphemed, I'd cursed God, I'd rebelled against His message, His church and His preacher, and I wasn't in, but what a blessed hour when the Spirit of God convicted me of my sins and as they came with that invitation number and the old Cherokee Indians is singing that night, the Holy Ghost is wooing my heart. And I fell in that sawdust shaving altar and just begged God to be merciful to me, a sinner. And the Lord saved my soul, ushered me into his kingdom. I became one of his children by regeneration and by spiritual adoption. And now I belong to him. I'm in the family, blessed be the Lord. And the most important thing you can know this morning is that you're in the family of God. You're not naturally born there. You have to be born again. You have to come by faith in the Lord Jesus, but you can be saved, glory to God. So there must be a belonging. Number two, there must be a building. Building up yourselves on your most holy faith. The crowd that will survive in this hour is those that keep on building and going on. If you just sort of plop down, sit down, the preacher opens his Bible, you just close your Bible. Well, I can't learn anything else. You just stagnate. You're not going to go anywhere. You're going to be destroyed is what's going to happen. But those that are building, those that are going to, and on the holy faith, that's what's under attack is my faith and your faith, believe in God. And sometimes, my friend, believe in God is uh, trusting him in the darkness where you can't see a way out. And uh, look through Hebrews chapter number 11. None of those fellows saw, saw the end of what God would do. It was at the end they could look back and say God's been faithful. God may not show you a high beam flashlight of what's before you, but he did say thy words a lamp unto my feet. And he'll give you a good step of light. And if you just walk in that basic one step, then the next step will come and the next and the first thing you know, you look back over a life that has served God and made a mark to the glory of God. Building up yourselves on your most holy faith. Keep believing God. And then he goes on to say, praying in the Holy Ghost. Belonging, building, praying. Praying in the Holy Ghost. It's time for Jude. It's time for us to get our prayer meetings cranked back up. The pastor's going in for this procedure in the morning. Don't just mention his name around the uh, dinner table today. Spend some earnest time in prayer. Ought to be the men's group and get together praying and the ladies' group are praying and asking God to give him the deliverance and that which he needs. And boy, when you get a Holy Ghost prayer band to praying about something in specific prayer, seeking the Lord's face, it moves the hand of heaven. Praise God, when the hand of heaven's moved, the earth will be shaken. Amen. What happened to our old-time prayer bands that get a hold of the name of an old sinner and start praying for them till God gets a hold of them? We're going to be having what we call the Middle Fork Revival Reunion here in just, well, next Saturday, God willing. And uh, back in 1981, the Lord sent a seven-week revival, and we're still finding out what God did in those days. But I'll never remember, forget about week number five. We came into the prayer uh, meeting one night, and old brother Jerry Whiteside said, keep praying for my brother. He said he's not coming. He said, he said he's not coming. He said, he's going to come. He said, I'm going to keep praying for him. Keep praying for him, boys. About the end of that week, Jerry come in. His eye was all swollen up. And I said, what happened to you? He said, oh, I went over and invited my brother again to the meeting and said he'd give me an uppercut and knock me out in the yard. He said, I just got up and looked at him and went across the road crying. 
said, before I got to the house, I could hear the phone ringing. said, I picked the phone up, and it's my brother. And he said, brother, I'm sorry. I hear you. I said, and I'll be there. He said, he's coming tonight. <laughs> Praise God. Guess what, old Terry, that big old giant of a man got in that altar and got saved. And then the Lord called him to preach and now he's pastoring a church and we're going to have a, a reunion down there. What God did in those days at his church come Saturday. Woo! Hallelujah. Boy, you get a Holy Ghost preach. Keep praying for them. Don't give up on them. Don't just casually bump it. Praying in the Holy Ghost. Let our altars get a fire again. Ran into a Korean evangelist and he told me about the revivals there in Korea. He said, there's somebody 24 hours a day on the altars of our church. He told about the prayer meetings they have. And that's what we're going to have to have, people. To combat this thing is spiritual, and it's going to take spiritual combating. Then not only praying in the Holy Ghost, but keep yourself in the love of God. Amen. Don't get mean because the devil gets mean with you. As one old preacher said, don't get the devil in you trying to get the devil out of them. It's not keeping God loving you, but it's staying in the love of God. And when they hit you with road rage, don't respond in road rage. Amen. And then he said, looking, keep looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus. I believe that's the second coming. All these fellas that have set dates and the ending of these calendars just bring mockers, say, ah, you say, he's got words he at the end. Well, God said that's exactly what they'd say. But he said, when you get up in the mornings, you look toward the eastern sky and say, perhaps today. We're getting closer than we've ever been. And don't ever lose that hope of the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. That'll keep us pure. And then he said, helping, and some having compassion, making a difference, and others saved with fear, pulling them out of the fire. Don't sit down at the house, pull the shades, and feel sorry for yourself because of all the attacks that are going on. Just keep reaching out and helping somebody else. And you'll find out, I, I know this for a fact, that when I go to the rest home to try to encourage those folk, I wind up with the encouragement. When I go visit the hospital to try to be a blessing, I wind up with the blessing. You'll never break your alabaster box of ointment poured out on Jesus' feet in serving others without getting it tangled up in your own hair and going out with more on you than you get on them. That's why it's more blessed to give. Give of your life. Give of yourself. Give in helping and compassion to others. It's more blessed to give than to receive because you're going to wind up receiving more than you're ever able to give. Woo, hallelujah. He said there is an alternative for the Christian. And then lastly, depending. Now unto him that's able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. Just keep depending on God. Not the arm of flesh, it fails me. But praise God, unto him that is able. And our hearts are depending upon him knowing that he will see us through anything that we'll ever have to face. And he closes out with a word of worship. He said, keep on worshiping. You know, sometimes we get loaded up and loaded down and we come in and it's hard to even stay focused long enough to hear a message. But if somehow we can say, God, clear my mind, give me a large pavilion that I might worship. This is what happens in the last verse to the only wise God, our Savior, be glory and majesty and dominion and power both now and ever. Amen. Brother Jude says, come worship in Him. And isn't it amazing when we get our mind and our heart fixed on Him how we forget about our troubles and everything else gets real small as we exalt Him that has all power, majesty and dominion and to Him be glory and honor forever. Let's bow our heads and hearts before him. Our song leader's coming with a song this morning. There's a heaviness on our nation. There's a heaviness in the heart of God's people. And I'd say there's a heaviness on some precious sinner this morning. You need to be saved. I want us to stand all over the house. If you want to come join these praying around the altar already, and God spoke to you, whatever your need is, you might need to take that wife by the hand or that husband and say, hey, 
Let's get this year started out right. Let's, let's, get, let's get in that altar and seek him together. And I don't know what all you're going through, but I know the one that is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the throne of his glory. I don't know what your burden or your need is. You might need to be saved today. God spoke to you. Come seek his face. What number do we have, brother? Page 124 in your own marriage. 124. Let's sing it out. Page 124. say this and we'll close young people when you see all these things coming to pass when you see the enemy coming in like a flood and the tidal waves don't back up and say well mama everybody else is God said that's the way the broad road would go that's the way the floods pressing people down to the city of destruction and drag you right out of this church Right out of a good family, away from the arms of people that love you. Don't look at that and say, well, that's the way it's all going. That's what I need to do. No, run from it. Run to Jesus. And he can help you live for God in the midst of all that's going on. He'll have a people. He'll have a church. He'll have young folk going on with God. You be one of those. You be one of those. We're singing one more stanza. These are still praying. You want to come pray? Come on right now as we sing. Thank you.